So today I'm going to talk about stereographic projections, uh, an introduction to stereographic projections, uh, which are basically angular projections. We already are used to spatial projections. So on the left, we have a complicated crystal, which we are looking at in three dimensions, and really it's uh, quite hard to perceive that. So what we do instead is we project onto the basal plane, just linear projection onto the basal plane. And that gives us uh, a view that looks like this. And we identify the heights of the species by fractional coordinates along the z-axis. Make, makes life a lot easier to see uh, a projection than a three-dimensional structure of a complex arrangement of atoms. What we are interested in today is angular projections. So here, for example, we have uh, arcs of circle. And in this case, we are simply linearly projecting the angles onto this line over here. Whereas here, we take a construction line from the value of the angle through the south pole here. And where this line intersects, the equatorial line here, identifies that angle. Now, the disadvantage of this kind of a projection is that if this was a sphere and we had a circle drawn on the sphere, the circle would project as an ellipse onto this plane. So this kind of a projection doesn't maintain angular truth. I will show you in the next slide that with this projection, a circle on top of the surface of the sphere will project as a circle onto this plane. So on this slide, I'm showing you a sphere uh, with its uh, North Pole, its South Pole, and the equatorial plane here. And there's a circle drawn on the surface of the sphere with diameter AB. And when we project every single point on this small circle, through the South Pole, we end up with points on the equatorial plane, which also represent a circle, a true circle. Okay, so the advantage of plotting in this way, uh, of projecting in this way, is that we maintain angular truth. This is a circle and that also is a circle. So let's, let's prove that, okay? So we take a section of the sphere along AB, and of course this is a, a cone here. So this is the section of the cone. There's uh, our AB. And the property of a cone gives us a conjugate circle CD, which is equally inclined to this axis here. So it follows that phi 3 is equal to phi 2. Now, if you look at, uh, if you look at this segment of the circle, then there are two triangles here which subtend the same segment here. And that means that phi 1 equals phi 2. Uh, and therefore, we can prove that the angle phi 3 is the same as phi 1. That means that the circle CD is parallel to the equatorial plane. So if I let it slide downwards, it will remain as a circle. And therefore, a dash b dash is a true circle. So the big advantage of doing a projection through the South Pole, or if you're looking at something underneath through the North Pole, is that we maintain angular truth. Now, if you, you must be familiar with longitudes and latitudes, and longitudes are generally um, circles that have the diameter of the Earth. We call them great circles in the context of stereographic projections. Latitudes, on the other hand, uh, are, have a diameter that's smaller than the diameter of the Earth, so we call them small circles. This particular uh, latitude, which uh, passes through the equator, is, is also a great circle because it happens to be a small circle drawn through the center of the sphere. So a small circle has a diameter that is smaller than that of the sphere, 
and the great circle has a diameter that is the diameter of the sphere. Now, suppose we take this sphere and we place a cubic crystal right in the middle. And this is the one zero zero direction of that cubic crystal, zero one zero direction and zero zero one. And what I want to do is introduce uh, a plane into this. And normally we represent a plane by a plane normal. So here is our plane, a blue plane. Uh, its indices happen to be zero, one, one, because it has no intersection along one, zero, zero. So if I plot the normal of that plane, then it intersects the sphere at this point here. So now I project that point so that it reaches the South Pole and where it intersects the equatorial plane identifies on my projection the location of the 0, 1, 1 plane normal. Okay, so, so this is called the pole of 0, 1, 1. In other words, the normal to the 0, 1, 1 plane. If uh, I want to project the normal to the zero bar one bar one plane, then that is the normal. And this time I project it through the North Pole. On the projection, instead of using a filled circle, we use a hollow circle to identify that that pole is in the Southern hemisphere of the sphere. So if I go back, this is in the Northern hemisphere and therefore it's a filled point, this is, from the southern hemisphere, this normal is in the southern hemisphere, and therefore we identify that as an open circle on our projection on the equatorial plane. Now, this is the plane uh, normal, and this is the plane. If I take this blue plane and expand it so that it fills much more area, then it will intersect the sphere along this line here. So this is actually the plane and its normal is along here. And just as I projected the pole, I can project every point on this plane through the South Pole and end up with a trace of the 0, 1, 1 plane. So this is called the trace of the plane. Uh, a trace is where two surfaces intersect. So we've got this plane intersecting the sphere and therefore this is the trace of that plane and this is the projection onto the stereographic uh, plane. So we also call this a trace and it's a continuous line because these are coming from the northern hemisphere. So just to summarize, uh, this is my stereographic sphere and these are the poles representing the axes of the crystal. So my Equatorial plane looks like this, with 0, 0, 1 right in the center. I then put a plane in the, uh, in the cubic crystal. I take its normal, project it through the South Pole, and we end up with a point over here on the equatorial plane, which is identified as this point on the stereographic projection. For the 0 bar 1, bar 1 direction, project it through the North Pole, and we end up with an open circle on the stereographic projection. And these are the traces in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere of the plane 011 as it intersects the sphere. So this pole here will be at 90 degrees to every point on its trace, okay? Because obviously the normal to a plane is at 90 degrees to everything in that plane. Okay, uh, we need uh, a method of measuring angles on the equatorial plane. So there's a construction called the wolf net where we, uh, we draw basically latitudes and longitudes at equal angles, uh, uh, space, spaced at equal angles uh, as follows. So here are the latitudes and longitudes spaced at 10 degree intervals. Uh, so 
you can see that the angles are a bit more compressed near the middle than uh, towards the edges. So this is 10 degrees and so is this 10 degrees. Uh, and similarly, there is angular distortion here, but angular truth is maintained. So this is called a wolf net. And we will use that to manipulate and to discover angles and other things on our stereographic projection. So the normal wolf net that you can get from the class laboratory has a higher resolution graduation. So each one of these little squares is two degrees and this is 10 degrees. Now, the property of a wolf net is that all the great circles are actually true great circles, okay? Uh, they are actually circles. These are, these great circles are arcs uh, of a true circle, which has a diameter that is bigger than that of the wolf net. So that's illustrated over here. This is a wolf net and this particular great circle has a, a diameter which is much larger than that of the wolf net. And very simple geometry tells you that if we look at this triangle here, okay, then R naught squared plus R minus X squared must equal R squared. So we can work out the radius of each of the great circles using this simple equation. Okay, so these are true arcs. The great circles are true arcs of real circles generally with diameters greater than that of the wolf net. But of course, the perimeter here is, is this uh, R becomes the same as the radius of the wolf net. Now, if I have a pole here and I identify all the points that are at 90 degrees to that pole, then that is the trace of that plane. Okay, so every point on here is at 90 degrees. If I count 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, that point is 90. Now, how do I work out what the angle is between this point and this pole and show you that that also is 90 degrees? Well, what we have to do is you cannot measure angles arbitrarily on the wolf net. Any two points that you make a measurement of must lie on a great circle before you can start counting. what I mean. So look, here is a great circle and there are two poles here located on that great circle and therefore I can just measure off the angle as 26 degrees. Similarly, you know, this is a great circle. It's a diameter of the sphere and therefore I can measure 90 degrees directly over here, but I can't do that and that. I'd have to bring, I'd have to rotate the wolf net to bring those two points into coincidence in order to measure the angle. Okay. Now let's uh, construct a stereographic projection for the cubic system. Thank you. 
The task now is to construct a stereographic projection representing some of the common planes in the cubic system. We will limit ourselves to plotting the poles that intersect the stereographic sphere in the northern hemisphere. To begin, we will draw a circle that represents the equatorial plane and then label the reference axes, in this case uh, the 100 type poles which are parallel to the unit cell edges. It is conventional to place the z-axis in the middle of the projection, the y-axis to the right and the x-axis at the bottom of the equatorial plane. We look at the 110 type poles next. 110 planes make an angle of either 45 degrees or 90 degrees to the 100 type planes as illustrated here. If you needed to, you could calculate the angle using the dot product to do so. Although bear in mind that the method illustrated applies only when the axes are orthonormal. It takes only two vectors to define a plane. Any others can be generated by a linear combination of these vectors. Bearing in mind that the trace of a plane on a stereographic projection is a great circle, the 110 pole must lie on the great circle containing 100 and 001. Uh, we need the wolf net in order to plot the actual poles by measuring an angle of 45 degrees, for example. So 110 lies on the perimeter of the equatorial plane, and 100, 110, and 010 are all in the same great circle, as is 011 with 001 and 010. Next, the 111 type poles. If we can find that the 111 pole lies on the intersection of two great circles, then the problem is solved. 001 plus 110 gives 111. Uh, this is the red great circle, which will shortly be drawn. So 111 must lie somewhere on that red great circle and 100 plus 011 also gives 111 uh, and therefore that can be represented on the green great circle on which 111 must lie. It follows that the intersection of the red and the green circ uh, great circle gives us the location of the 111 pole. All the remaining 111 poles can be generated by using the fact that 001 is a fourfold axis of rotation. So this now is the complete stereographic projection for the northern hemisphere. And notice that the projection is divided into stereographic triangles which have 001, 111 and 011 at the corners. And each of these stereographic triangles is crystallographically equivalent in the cubic system. So if you are plotting, for example, the modulus on the, as a function of orientation, then only one stereographic triangle is necessary to represent that variation. So this is the cubic system. And uh, just, just for fun, I've also included a pole from the southern hemisphere, which is the negative of 0, 1, 1. Okay. Um, okay, so we decided that we have angular truth with the method that we are using for projecting information. So 
the only slight complication is that the center of this circle will not correspond to the geometric center of this circle because we have angular distortion. If you look at the wolf net, the angles are more compressed towards the middle than towards the edge of the net. So this, for example, is the geometric center. That means the distance here and here is identical. And this is the angular center. That means the angle here is the same as the angle here. So in order to construct a small circle around a particular pole, okay, so all, everything here is at the same angle to B. So if I want to construct a circle about the point, uh, the pole B, then I place it onto a great circle, measure whatever angle I set the circle to. So in this case, it would be one, two, three, 36 degrees this way and 36 degrees this way. Okay, so I identify the points A and D, which are both 36 degrees away from B on a great circle because we can only measure angles on a great circle. Uh, when I join A and D, the center of that line, AD, is my geometrical center, and I can use this radius here to construct this circle. Okay, so to construct the circle, we use the geometric center, uh, and that is the projection of a circle, a small circle. And of course, if you have an intersection between two small circles, then these two points will have the same angle with the pole P1 and the pole P2. Okay, okay now we've seen that there are elements of symmetry in a cube. Uh, you can see that there's a fourfold axis poking out of the plane of this diagram. Uh, there's a, a threefold axis along the body diagonal, and this is along a 110 type direction, so it's a twofold axis of rotation, so dyad triad and tetrad. And we can represent these symmetry elements on our, our stereographic projection. So here are all the 110 type directions, which are dyads. These are all the body diagonals. And we know that there are four triads in a cubic system. That's the defining symmetry of a cube. And these are the fourfold axes of symmetry. So if you imagine this, you know, you can clearly see that there is fourfold symmetry about this. this. This particular pole is poking out of the plane of the diagram, so it's easy to see the symmetry. Now we can use uh, a, a diagram like this to plot the magnitude of the modulus as a function of where we are looking at in the crystallographic orientation. So here is a good example. This is uh, the elastic modulus uh, of uh, ferritic iron, body center cubic iron. And this is the 100 zero, zero pole, zero, zero, 001 and zero, 010. Zero. And you can see, whoops, so Daisy. And you can see that uh, the modulus is highly anisotropic and we expect that with crystalline materials, okay? So here, for example, the modulus might be just over 300 gigapascals, whereas here it'll be of the order of a hundred gigapascal, uh, mega, yeah, gigapascals. Right, um, I want to show you an operation using the stereographic projection to prove that the symmetry element bar two, that means a rotation of 180 degrees followed by an inversion through the center is exactly the same as a mirror plane. So imagine this is our, our stereographic sphere, and I have a pole here, which is marked one, and I project it through the south pole, then that gives me this point on the equatorial plane, which is also identified in the equatorial plane here. Okay. Now, if I operate now by the twofold rotation, then I generate another pole here, 
which again projecting through the south pole gives me an additional pole. And you can see that this is purely a rotation of 180 degrees about an axis going vertically through the diagram, uh, through this stereographic projection. Okay, now I'm going to take this point two and invert it through the center. This is the center. So I end up with a pole which is in the southern hemisphere and therefore it's an open circle and it's directly below this pole one in the stereographic projection. So clearly this plane here, the equatorial plane, is a mirror plane because this is being reflected into this uh, by that plane. So an operation bar two is the same as a mirror plane. So if you recall the defining symmetry of an orthorhombic crystal class is 2 to 2. It must have three diodes. Now if you look at this table it's a little bit confusing because this is not 2 to 2, it's MMM, three mirrors. But if you bear in mind that a mirror is the same as bar 2, that means you simply have a diod and a mirror plane normal to that, then we satisfy the defining symmetry of the orthorhombic class. We can do some other experiments with stereograms. So here I have a stereographic projection with a fourfold axis in the middle. If I put on this a pole of the general form, right? So general form means it's not located on any particular symmetry element. Uh, and I operate the fourfold axis. That means a 90 degree rotation. Then I produce this pole, this pole, and this pole. Okay. So this is what results if I place an atom in a general position and operate my fourfold axis. And notice that there is no center of symmetry because if I take this pole and I invert it through the middle, then I should get an open circle. So this axis uh, does not have it does not uh, result in a center of symmetry. Here is now my threefold uh, axis. Uh, if I take this pole and I rotate by 120 degrees, I get to this and another 120 degrees here. Again, there is no center of symmetry here because if I take this pole and invert it through the center, I should have a circle here. So a three-fold axis also doesn't have a center of symmetry. It doesn't produce a center of symmetry when you operate it on an object located in a general position. However, if I change this into a bar three, so this is bar three, and I take a pole in a general position, rotate by 120 degrees, invert it through the center, then I get an open circle, I then rotate this by 120 degrees, invert it through the center, and I get a pole of the general form. Rotate by 120 degrees, invert through the center, I get that. Okay. So there clearly is a center of symmetry because this and this are related by that center of symmetry. So changing three to bar three gives us a center of symmetry. Bar six, on the other hand, uh, that is not the case. Uh, so if I take this pole and I rotate by 60 degrees invert through the center, I get this open circle and so on. So if you, if you do that exercise, you'll see that you get uh, a projection which looks like this, but there is no center of symmetry here because I've got nothing on this side. If I take this uh, black point inverted through the center, I don't get anything here. So if you have a crystal uh, whose point group is bar six, it does not have a center of symmetry and it's likely to show piezoelectric properties. So that is all for today and I will continue with stereographic projections in the next lecture. Thank you.